Sports fans, we are back. This is going to be your Crank Brothers race review. Yes, we are back racing. It was hardline. I'm Andrew Nietling. Crank Brothers is synonymous with DH Racing. Last year, set a rank 13 years in a row. Elite world champ wins with that mallet DH pedal. It's not just pedals. They are adding to their product offering. Last few years, you've seen a host of podium containers, race winners, and the shoes like Lucas Shaw, Cami Belange, Troy Brosen, and Benoit Coulange. Now, a podcast favorite, Sven Martin, is on the ground in Tasmania with his family. If you hear a little girl, Ziggy, in the background, that's the youngest superfan of the circuit. She's getting some serious experience out there. And uh, Anka's in the background as well. But Sven, Tasmania, super exciting to have another uh, version of Hardline. Obviously, Wales has been going for 10 years but uh, I think they knocked it out the park for the first year. There was a lot of rumors that the track wasn't going to be as gnarly and some of the jumps, landings were a bit flat and shame poor. Dave had that hor- horrific crash testing, but that's what happens when you're trying to push the boundaries of mountain biking. But uh, overall, I think it was a huge success. Yeah, I don't think there's been a better first edition of, of any event, be that a, a World Cup a hard line, a fair series, a dark fair style event. All the early years of all these other events, the first editions, there's it's like chaos and pandemonium and people just getting carted off in helicopters and hospitals and jumps not working, lips being moved, everything being fixed. Um, once once this week begun, um, thankfully you know, because of the the couple of riders, Chaos Bernard and, and some others, did some testing three weeks ago. Um, a few minor adjustments were made, and that you know that was all that was needed. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the the course withstood the the whole week. It's like actually a long riding week. The guys were riding by Tuesday. Tuesday there were wheels on the ground um, and held up till till Saturday. And a big field of riders as well. So, yeah, for first edition, um, it takes a special kind of venue, location, and a special kind of um, crew of, you know, uh, diggers, visionaries um, to make it happen. And Simon and his dirt art crew here in Medina, um, you know, they only did this in less than less than four months, three and a half months from like from okay, we're doing this to to um, till now. That's and that's quite something if you see the amount of dirt um, and the logistics of getting into where the dirt was built. It's easy to build uh, uh, jumps of, you know, 70, 80 foot and 16, 20 meters drops and stuff when you've got excavators and diggers. But when you're working in the steep native bush, you can't get a big digger in there. So you're moving like tons of dirt, often by hand or or mini excavators. So, yeah, hats off hats off to them um i'm gonna close this door because the bath is running and uh, it's making a noise <laughs> so uh people on the audio version sven's giving a lot of his family time over to us so thanks to him because his first hour after uh, like he just mentioned since tuesday last week they were on the ground but uh yeah i think he hit the nail on the head huge success for the first year it looked great on uh, tv as you say, I think props to, and and I think we should shout him out again. Is you know Dave is sitting in hospital recovering from an horrific crash, you know helping test these jumps, and you, you can't always get them perfect. But that was really smart for them to get mm. riders like Bernard Kerr, Chaos to go over there. Chaos has been to Darkfest. He can kind of hopefully judge, uh, you know, big fast jumps. Bernard Kerr loves yeah, test, testing stuff, and then um, that way. They've got accurate feedback from riders that are going to do the event. Like, what do you need to make sure this is a success? And and in the end, actually, the the jump that Dave came up short on, um, you know, it it, it uh, I wouldn't be surprised if down the line they actually move it to that original size because um, you would have seen in some of the clips there definitely was a couple of quite a lot of overshooting. So, you know, yeah, Brooke needs the Dave, landing back. Yeah, Brooke will take Dave's size jump um, gladly. But um, yeah, and, and you're talking about Ziggy being the youngest fan. It was pretty cool. You've got, I want to say, middle of nowhere, but it's hard to get to Tasmania, and especially if you've got 
want to bring all your bikes and stuff, you, a lot of people are going to be camping because there's no accommodation. So then you're going to bring their camping set up. So then they're going to drive it. So that's a 12 hour ferry ride. And then how knows, who knows how many hours from wherever in Australia you're driving from. And you get like 5,000 people that descended on this little mountain town. Some came early and there was like a bike fest happening all week, regular downhill racing, pump track, whip offs, um, kids race. Uh, so there was like a lot of other stuff going on. Um, but this, the Friday and the Saturday, you know, you had these diehard fans and so many tiny little kids um, with bikes, push bikes, you know. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty cool. I yeah, just reminded me a bit more of like the early grassroots, grassroots Norba days when, you know, you're camping and hanging out. There's nothing else to do. There's like no one's going home to their hotels and condos because like as well as the riders you know they're sleeping in tents so it's a special vibe you know um which makes this event just feel a bit more you know i, I don't know um as world cups have got so professional is, there's a there's a disconnect with um reality or or um the grassroots level but this one you know riders are camping fans are camping um riders are riding spectators are riding had a couple of people who's been a digger here for many years. He was one of the sort of lead diggers here, and he was also one of the early testers. And he's the fifth amongst his world's best. You know, he he's a got racing heritage, um, done a couple of World Cups uh, over the years, and and shame. Um, he actually rebroke his collarbone that had been broken four weeks before in his seeding run, but still finished the run, like didn't crash. Like it was just the impact of the landing kind of rebroke his collarbone and it was screwed as well. Um, so it's, it's a sad not to see him uh, just, uh, just before I forget, I wanted to mention him. Um, yeah. And Baxter, my well, there's a couple of guys in Jai, um, Motherwell, those local sort of wild cards um, that also helped make the week possible. Yeah, it is really cool to get this some air time, you know, like air time, broadcast time. They're on Red Bull TV. The, the you know, the replay on YouTube is free, like the hundreds of thousands of views. I don't know on the app, you know, just as many. So it's really cool to see that diversity in the event. But it is a world class event. Like the guys are going yeah. for the win. It's good for your CV. Um, you know, people are saying like, can this take over the World Cup? It's like, it's kind of different. It's kind of like Crankworks. It's different. You know, there's not the depth yeah, there. Not, not, I don't, I don't know if you're going to always see the to top, compete. top. Yeah. It's like, it's, it is a different event where the camaraderie of the riders come together. Yes. When you're in the start yeah. gate, as we'll talk about later is like Jackson was going for the win, like probably too hard in hindsight. But, uh, mm -hmm. leading up to it, they're all towing each other through the jumps, they're hanging out. Like you say, you're forced to hang out and connect, like the Dark Fest vibe, which is a jam. But the challenge with an event like this, and when you say, okay, maybe the jump should go back to 90 foot, 100 foot, that's all well and good if you can ride it when the wind's good. But if you have a race time, that's where you've got to kind of build some safety in with the wind and stuff. Dark Fest, the riders just don't ride if it's windy, and that's 90 yeah. foot, and you're going the and same sort of speed. You know, there was a, a little bit of um, – chatter once the people saw how well the riders were sessioning it and some of the the povs of course povs never do scale of, of track justice um and then they were like oh you know it, it can't be as hard as wales it's not hard enough to be a hard line and that is like 100 percent factually incorrect um yeah, even just a small way of putting it in perspective, you know, we see people doing flips all over Hardline, you know, um, and you see riders from Darkfest that can flip all the Darkfest jumps, which we all know are massive, but you didn't see any of those guys flipping the big doubles and the big jumps here. Why? Because it's too, it's, it's too hard. It's too dangerous. Um, so 100% this lived up to the Hardline billing and every Hardline's going to be different. What is amazing, because, Back in the EWS days, you used to have each event organizer, local event organizer, trying to outdo the previous guy, and they wanted to make the longest, the hardest, the steepest, the most climbing, the most descending, um, like a big, I was going to say dick waving contest, but maybe we can say <laughs> well, that here because it's is. your podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, you can. But, so this is not this true, didn't though. Happen here. And, and Simon the saying is actually right. dick swinging, not waving. Okay. Just you know, It's like get yeah. the saying right. 
Okay, so he didn't. Yeah, some people wave, some people swing. Um, he he didn't he didn't like look at like Red Bull hard, hardline whales and be like, okay, I need to build a bigger drop or a longer gap. So it, it, you know, um, yeah. So that was that was good to see, and it worked out. And 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 for sure, like if you have a rider like Jackson Goldson and Dan Booker that you know couldn't complete the course, I, I would say it's hard enough. You know. Um, not that you want anyone to go down at, at any time of the week, but um, yeah, uh, well and truly hard enough. And, and just the scale and size, like the, the biggest, say, natural feature, the fourth, sort of the fourth drop you would have seen in the course, um, just after the section where Jackson crashed, you're coming in blind, and nearly all of these actually, you're coming in blind. You don't see the landing. You Maybe only the road gap do you see when you're like getting onto the container um, and maybe the last jump with the only two jumps you're not seeing coming in blind. Not only are you coming in blind, you're coming out of natural native section and you're having to turn or reposition or you can't just leave the lip straight and the landing is not exactly where, it's not straight from where the lip left. And the biggest natural feature, um, it had like a, you came onto this, you, know, you were turning, you were de-weighting, you were half turning and you were on a sort of painted like Fort Williams style boardwalk for the last little bit. And um, man, you should imagine just, and at that point, there's no bailing out because once you get onto that, you couldn't quite stop in time. So you, and then you also, basically by the time you can see the landing, it's too late to stop whether you've got it right or wrong. So you just got to, got to go. Um, and when you've got greasy mud packed on the front tire and you've got to turn on this painted wood and carry distance. And then right after that, you have to land the berm with so much speed. There's the, Biggest step up, it looked small because the guys were tricking it, but man, you haven't seen anything that size in the World Cup track. But having said that, um, it's very apparent um, that some of the big stuff the guys were just toying with, and the girls, um, when I say guys in this podcast, I'm meaning guys and girls, it's, it's a collective term. Um, it is very clear that we do need to, on the World Cup level, it, it, it does need to be a smaller gap between a hardline course and a World Cup course. It should be too hard for a lot of riders to ride. Um, some juniors shouldn't be allowed to race it, and some elites as well. Like they wouldn't be able to, you know. You shouldn't be able to just, you know, one was doing a job here, um, doing a, a morning show for the Red Bull TV broadcast, and he was on his trail bike because he was like kind of presenting. So, but he was, you know, um, watching the action so he could, uh, you know, talk about it. And he was on his trail bike, and he was riding a lot of the courses. A lot of people would see, but he was riding, you know, like all the in between bits. There were still some big long senders, but you know, it was impossible to do on a bike like his. But I would say on a World Cup track it would be possible for me to do, including all the features on the World Cup track, I, 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 I'm going to say I could do it on me, my age currently, I could ride every feature on nearly every World Cup track as it's designed to be ridden. 100%, I couldn't even get through 30% of this track on my bike. So I think not that we should gauge hardline tracks or World Cup tracks on what a 50-year-old on a 29er can ride. With a camera but, bag? Yeah, with a camera bag, I reckon. Um, but that should say something, you know. But you were talking just before we got on here um, about another special thing from the hardline and, and the camaraderie that you witnessed. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, you, you, yeah, it, it is very much like that dark fest vibe and sort of an organic grassroots event where all these competitors are more like stoked for each other, filming each other, helping each other, um, guys helping girls, girl, girls helping the other girls. Um, yeah, it, it's really cool to see, you know. Um, Hardline Wales has been going for 10 years or close to 10 years, I guess. And in the early years when I was, you know, I shot a lot of these Hardline events, um, you would see that a lot. And more recently, because the guys have sort of got the features dialed, they more like not, not sessioning it or in step by step as they go down the mountain. They're just sort of doing more full runs earlier in the week. So... So there was a lot of sessioning the first few days just just to, just to sort of conquer the course. Yeah, and uh, maybe like for the listener, you see the clips on social media and a few people towing each other, but 
hard line from what I understand is especially a new Tasmania one, people sort of get to the top of the track and then they go together and decide which features they're going to tick off. And then it seems like they all kind of tick a feature off, help each other, and then they move down to the next feature. It, it kind of seems like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big – so this mountain's a lot bigger than Hardline Wales. So it, it's like another minute of ride time, maybe another kilometer and a half in track distance, maybe more. I'm not, I'm not even sure the stats. But uh, so on the early days, you know, um, there's so many features on this track that compared to, say, Hardline um, Wales – you wouldn't be able to have medic sat at every single feature all week long. There's just too many, you know. Um, so, so pra early practice days, we pretty much everyone is practicing as a, as a crew. So you're moving together. So you got like kind of two features open at the same time, and and medics and medical and marsh like sort of marshals, because um, the rest of the mountain was live with with spectators, which is actually another good thing. I love going to a bike event where you can ride your bike. You know, there's quite a few World Cup tracks where there's a few tracks open. Um, some crank event, crankworks events like Whistler, you, you can ride, but then you go to Innsbruck and, and the tracks are closed. There's nowhere to ride. Um, you know, like if you're going to go to for a weekend of spectating, you want to ride your bike. Otherwise, really, what's what's the point, you know? Um, so this was cool. So definitely sessioning going on and, and guinea pigging and figuring it out. And, and a couple of those riders I mentioned earlier, they would, um, or the invited wild cards, and there was a couple like Jai that didn't race. You know, they were sacrificial lambs, so to speak, and and they would, they knew it was an honor to be invited, and they're like, all right, well, I'm going to do my job. I'm I'm the guinea pig, you know, um, or something, you know. And and actually talking about guinea pigging, what was very interesting and really cool to see, and I was surprised with amongst the the women. Um, I'm going to say every major big feature was done first by a different rider, um, which you would have thought one felt more comfortable than the others, and they would have been the ones sort of leading the charge. Um, but each one, each feature was, which was also a nice thing about this track, was different enough that it um, that it, that appealed to a different rider's strengths and and style. So like. Tane, who didn't do the big natural feature first, she opened the road gap first, and you know Lou did this. First. So it was it was pretty cool to see, um, yeah, each feature get unlocked by a different rider. I think even in the men's, it was it wasn't always just one person unlocking all the features. Yeah, I definitely noticed that. Um, it's awesome to see the woman there. Um, you obviously got the two sort of younger ones and the experience of Tane. And she obviously mentioned in your interview with her, like, why is she there? Everyone would think, what are you doing coming back from these injuries? Are you not focused on the World Cup? And going back to your roots and why you started racing is the excitement because it's new, pushing yourself, especially when you're young. You don't think about crashing. You just think about unlocking a new jump. Or like you said, you've – I mean, I remember going to my dirt jumps – and no one was around, but the jump, I got, I got it finished. So I, I wanted, I just tested it on my own and went flying over mm. the bars, like the stupidest thing ever, but I got up giggling. Luckily I wasn't hurt. Um, so it was cool to see that. And then on the men's, so who was the, was there an MVP standout that wanted to guinea pig first or kind of shimmy to the front of the line or did everyone well, kind of just play it smart? And if someone felt no. good, they did that one. And then like, how was someone like, dick swinging for lack of a better term like you said earlier in the men's side um well well, well ronan Dunn um, didn't have not, a bike no, so maybe he would have he didn't have a bike oh, yeah, there yeah, for that, the that, testing that, 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 <laughs> maybe maybe it's better he, in the end like we can talk about that um i'm gonna say like bernard as always he kind of he's in the world cup chat groups he's not afraid to speak his word. If he thinks something should be done a certain way or we need to practice now, he's very much the voice of all the riders. Um, but also buried in there, he's also thinking what's going to be best for him to some degree, you know? Um, so he definitely got a few more runs on the track, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about before race day. But for sure, the, the jump that was unknown, the big road gap after the container, and and um, the creek gap, which which was made a little bit shorter after Dave's um, crash, Darcy, yeah, I wouldn't say he took responsibility, but he built the jump, 
he wanted to get over the jump. And that, that is quite a cool thing with um, even, even the guys at, at um, Darkfest, you know, um, or hard, uh, Dark, yeah, Darkfest. Um, that, that was a point of pride. And he, if anything was wrong with the jump, because you were literally going as fast as you could go on the bike, you lost a little speed going going into the lip. But you know how it is when you, you've run Darkfest, you don't know what a jump's going to do to you when you're going literally as fast as you can ride a bike and not brake tap. And then do you pull a bit? Do you squash? He wanted to be the first over, A, because he built it, B, because Dave got hurt, and then he rebuilt it. So he, if anyone was going to get hurt or he, if he needed to relay the speed that you needed to go, he wanted to be the guy. So for sure, um, thanks to Darcy for doing that. But no, in the, in the men... They were kind of getting ahead of us. We were shooting features, and, and I couldn't actually tell you who hit all the features first, but for sure, you know, Burton's always comfortable out there. But um, uh, no, it's a bit of everyone, a bit of, a bit of everything and everyone. Um, yeah. Um, Ronan was, yeah, it was a uh, shame. Poor Ronan, he was like, we was definitely one of the, the most frothing guys. And he, he getting a bike sent from Queenstown and like they literally, you know, when you call the airport sometime and they have no idea where your bike is. And, you know, it's either going to be in Queenstown or Melbourne. I think he went via Melbourne. Um, and uh, I, I don't know why the riders don't all put an Apple AirTag in because it, it's a no brainer. It doesn't really necessarily help you get your bike quicker, but you can sometimes yeah actually sometimes it does because you can tell them exactly where it is and they can look harder and but in the end you know maybe he was the freshest when it come down to race day or maybe he didn't end up crashing in the early runs getting over froth or you know the least less runs you know he did he missed a full almost two days of practice he got it um tuesday afternoon and then when he did hit it everyone already hit and they were no longer sessioning and stopping and looking he'd literally jumped the top three quarters of the course blind before he caught up to where all the rest of the riders got to. So that would have been terrifying. Um, but for Ronan, you know, he's um, he he used to be that kind of rider more um, when we used to kind of make fun of Ronan that he would like show up or blow up and or both, um, or he'd like be at the non quali party with like a one point five liter bottle of wine. But he's he's a you know, and that's couple, not even three years ago. I remember that being that Ronan and he's maturing very quick and he's a very dangerous racer. You know, he was on the old sort of bike. I asked him, why is he not on the new bike? And he's actually, yeah. So not only did his not bike not arrive for two days, he's never really ridden that old bike. He's only ridden the new bike since he signed with the team. And it's all he's been testing and riding on since he received the bike. So he was riding a bike he's not ridden. And that was just because of that old bike is 100% tested in terms of size and scale and and, and uh, maybe the new bike they weren't comfortable not saying the new bike would have snapped but they haven't done that they haven't had as much time and done that kind of real world testing so that was a kind of a safe decision for the engineer I get to make and I would be even faster on the new bike so that was quite scary yeah, I did hear that, but I thought he was pretty humble saying like he didn't feel he missed much because everyone was sessioning, right? So they're not getting laps on the track. Like if you miss a whole day of laps on a new track, probably a disadvantage, but maybe a ah, little bit true. of like ignorance is bliss, you know, like, well, I don't really know much about the features and you guys will blah, blah, blah. So he just gets into it. He's 21 or whatever he is now doesn't think as much as an older statesman. So I think it played a little bit into his favor as well, which he said. I mean, yes, in a perfect world, he would have started and ridden with him. But, yeah, I mean, I'm a fan for sure, big fan. Like he's he's young, he's exciting. Uh, his fitness is obviously catching up with, you know, his raw pace. Um, and he's going to have a race head. And when you win events like this, even though you could argue that field's not as deep, track's gnarly. So over three minutes, you could hear the guys talking about how physical it was, and you've got to then concentrate and jump these big jumps. I think it's going to be good for his confidence, that's for sure. Any race win is good for your confidence. Yeah, I mean, you're still racing other World Cup winners and World Cup um, podium, contenders, podium riders. Yeah. You know, there's Definitely. multiple World Cup win winners in the field, um, not just Jackson. But, um, yeah, going back to that whole... Uh, why would you race this just before a World Cup season? Um, 
Yeah, that's a this big is what the guys, topic, isn't this it? This is what, but this is what the guys want, and and it is sort of calculated risk when it comes down to it. Um, and like Tani mentioned, and and like you know, Jackson said, you know, you you could clip a pedal training on your training bike, doing laps at home, or in World Cup practice, or so. Once they've decided, like they feel comfortable on the track, it's it's just another sort of downhill run to them, you know. And and I and I also knew, just like nearly every hard line, the crashes are not going to come from any of the features. They never, they almost without fail never do. I'm going to say like 90% of any crash at any hard line has not come from a feature. It's come from the in between downhill bits. Um, you know, maybe you haven't done the exact amount of runs or uh, on pace runs as you would have at a downhill world cup and without fail like we saw booker we saw jackson and there were both sections where they were probably ramping up to speed hadn't gone that fast and their bike reacted unexpectedly on a line they haven't um, rode at that speed you know and uh, and that's exactly what happened and, and that's happened in hard line wales that happens everywhere you know so your mind is elsewhere when you when you're writing these things um but everyone for, seems to forget there's still proper downhill track in between all, all the 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 gnar um but you know that's what they're here for and that's what they want and that's what they want out of tracks and um you know uh, we'll see the extent of, of uh jackson's injury probably in the next day or two when he gets an mri scan but from back home and Hopefully it's just MCL, not too much ACL damage, and he will have enough recovery time to sort of be fit for the World Cup season ahead of him. It's a valid point, though. So that's like a huge topic. Why are some of these top riders there and yeah. Jackson shouldn't gone? Like it's such a, it's like a perfect science, right? Hindsight. Well, Jackson shouldn't have gone. He's crashed. He yeah. might ruin his World Cup season. I well, don't think he'll have any regrets. A couple of things like, yeah, like he he doesn't, PD was there as well. So like they made a team decision to go there. Laurie was there. And like you said, it was a racing incident and they're going to go racing somewhere. And the track conditions yeah, had um, changed. They said it was a lot I mean, wetter could... in the morning. It dried out. He picked the speed he was going to hit that section. Um, maybe the fastest he's hit it in the last two days under racing mm -hmm. conditions. And he just got kind of bucked on his rear wheel um, and over the bars and luckily he didn't hit that first tree. I will say, and I'm sure they all know it, it's not a European venue, so they don't have those amazing ski mats uh, and padding. They definitely got to pad more of the trees now. That's another thing they're yeah. going to learn for the next one. But they oh, didn't yeah, do it on I'd purpose and they don't have the same sort of um, equipment that they do in other ones. But, yeah, it's an awesome topic. And, and also... I think done correctly, these races do help with your confidence. Uh, yeah. Tony... Uh, Gracie, uh, Louise, they're going to have confidence going into the World Cups for sure. Um, and the men as well. I mean, I know. I was sitting on the couch going, huh, maybe I should go do hardline. I mean, I did dark fest. You know, like, be phased, I'm, a, phased. I'm an old guy. Yeah, exactly. I'm just saying, like, you get this diluted confidence by, like, ticking off bigger jumps than you've ever ticked off in your life. Like, yeah. that, you, yeah. you're, you go up a step in your mind. Yeah. So it's quite yeah, interesting. Like It'll be cool to see. When I have a day surfing big waves, um, and you just you know you you're focused you're on a different you know mindset and you everything's all your senses are, are are sort of hyper. And then the next day, if I go surf either that same wave and it's smaller, or I go to the the beach break and it's half or quarter the size, I can 100% surf way better with way more confidence than I did the day before, um, or sorry, than I did normally at that spot. So, you know, without a doubt, the same thing will apply um, to the, the regular World Cups for, for all these riders. And then even yeah, even, be... even even um, one of, uh, one of the, the kind of coolest things I heard, this is sort of jumping around all over the place as we normally do, um, Tommy G uh, said, well, probably with the most profound statement that you can take away from this whole event. He says, I'm a way better rider than I ever was a week ago. And, and it's like, that's what events and tracks and things like this do to you. I mean, this is a, one of the best mountain bike slope stylers in the world. A Red Bull rampage, top 10 rider, like, um, 
So it's pretty, you know, it's it opens your mind to hear. People, and obviously, it's not a racer, but uh, the whole track in general has has made a made him a, a better rider, you know. So in the, in a short space of like five days. Yes, I heard that as well, and it is profound, and it's totally accurate because you take these riders out of their comfort zone. What do they do most mm. off seasons? They're on their local tracks that they know. They're in the gym that they know very well. They're on the road bike. They're doing all these things, these like incremen- uh, incremental gains, and it's all very necessary. But the few guys maybe that go out of their comfort zone and push themselves, even on the downhill World Cup scene, they're going to be more comfortable at bigger obstacles at a World Cup or at speed. Yes, other World Cup riders will catch up very quickly, but it's going to be interesting to see how this develops in the future. And I think you'll see more top World Cup riders going out there if the schedule allows because the first year is always that test phase like i didn't want to go near hardline the first few years and i didn't go i was like it's too risky but yeah that was a very raw different style that dan built in wales the first few years you know there were a lot more yeah. crashes on those obstacles than tasmania had um, and, and i've said it all along someone said oh it has to be sketchy it has to be this i was like i disagree i think Especially, well, at a World Cup level, things can be very big and safe. Those things yeah. can go together. But when it's so, sketchy and big, like, and that's a lottery, I don't really like that. I don't think that's hardline either. I don't think hardline guys want to crash. They just want you out of your comfort zone, you know, and they want to no, the push sport, the level the sport, of riding. Yeah, no, the sport has progressed beyond that. You know, we're not like new old disorder style riders anymore. Everything's very. the just course building is a very professional, you know, it was proper diggers out there and world-renowned diggers, just like this crew here at Dirt Art and, um, and all over the world. So, yeah, we're, um, we've all smartened up and it's no longer a little, um, yeah, it's no longer like an extreme sport like that. Um, it's, it's still a very professional sport, even this, even the hardline version of it. And, um really cool to see it in another venue and become a bit of a series. And, and there was talk that next year we might be looking at three venues um, and just slowly grow it like that. And um, it does become tricky when, when you, you know, for instance, this year, I think you've got an event the weekend before Leo gang, you know, um, then you wonder if you'll lose some of the world cup riders or, or, or not. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, now this this Tasmanian one was was sweet. I'd I'd been here four times, three or four times before. Um, and funny enough, a little funny story. Not that it shouldn't take anything away from the hardline course. Um, right out the start gate, there was a natural section, super steep, and there was like a steep, and then there was like a drop at the end of the steep, um, which was actually the top of a EWS stage. Uh, last year or edr stage last year um but then from there on out that like everything was new and different but we got up there with uh with reese and simon uh, reese who's been instrumental at this park for a number of years and then, and then simon obviously who runs and owns and builds the park and he was stopped and uncle and me were riding uncle was carrying one of my like half full camera bags and he and reese and and simon we'd never ridden with him before and he wanted to show us this new fresh section they just cut for the bike park and he like stopped to stop me to like explain to us that it's pretty sketchy shoot super steep with a drop on the end and uncle just like rolled up and the three of us are off our bikes kind of peering over the edge uncle just rolls up track stands doesn't even unclip and then just like let's go her brakes and just sends it down um and i was like holy shit i, I can't believe she did that before me or without looking and then recent um Reese and Simon like looked at each other like, all right, sweet. These two guys are safe to take, or Unger at least is safe to take down this track. Um, and but then you add in a race environment and you add in weather and and Dan Booker probably one of the, the craziest people known for his EDR stuff. But if you see what he can do in a dyno bike, like these on-off stuff and manuals and toboggans and and uh, threes and stuff. Um, not at this track, didn't do any threes, but. Um, and and that's a section that's somewhat innocent in a race environment and add in a bit of greasy weather because it hadn't dried up at the top even on race day. Um, yeah, that 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 caught him out unfortunately. So yeah, 
Um, I don't but he seeded well, though. I mean, he seeded near the back. No, there is no point. We just go in circles in a good way. Um, Dan, was, Dan was Dan, Dan seeded was my... super well and then smashed himself on that first section. Yeah, yeah. So he, he's bummed, but he's he's okay. Um, but like bruised and bent in every part of his body, but he's okay. Oh, and he got and he got and, mentioned... and he got. But hang on, on Dan Booker and Sam Hill, like found him. Is that the guy? Um, Apparently, he was like a local in Tasmania, and he went riding with Sam. I don't know. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say Sam Hill found him, but Sam Hill or just said like you're basically vouched, shit, like, vouched, yeah, yeah, you basically like yeah, yeah, vouch for him. He, he vouched for him, and he got him on the nuke proof program, and and he like was like, yeah, we want to have this guy. We, he deserves it. And but uh, like within the Kiwi, Oz, within the Kiwi and Aussie scene, like Book has been you know around. He just maybe didn't. Yeah, maybe Sam Hill is responsible for getting onto the world stage and giving him a, a bit of a career opportunity. And this week he's on a new a new bike. Um, Santa Cruz and Shram are sort of doing a program like they've done back in the day with you know, like Lucas Shaw and 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 those kids when they had their little sort of a, a supported team. And he's on that program, so that's good to see that uh, without the nuke proof, he's able to you know still be out there this year doing what he wants to do race wise. Yeah, that's epic. So going down, we had and there's what was cool is we saw some of the new riders de- debuting bikes. Like Brooke McDonald looked like excited and eager as ever, right? And he seems Man, to be getting yeah. on with a new new bike and like on a like a He's resurgence so... kind of like new tear. I can just kind of see like I don't know. I think he just wants it even more now. I don't know. I just saw that from no. That's exactly you're right. What, 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 that's exactly or exactly right. He was like re rejuvenated, re energized. Yeah, re rejuvenated. Yeah, all those words can re- work. Yeah, um, rejuvenated, like re energized, reinvigorated. Reinvigorated? reinvigorated. Yeah, that's probably yeah, yeah. the worst of the three. But put it in the I comments the if uh, we can. Yeah, revigorated. Anyway, anyway, he he he's like um, Brooks. Like Brook is such a solid thick muscle of a man but somehow he's like <laughs> he's leaner he's lost i don't know he said he said 10 kg i can't see that because his legs and thighs and quads are still as big as ever but uh and he's and the the bike um will know how brook rides um and it's and it's it's not that the bikes he's been uh, been on have been bad it's just some bikes suit, suit a certain rider style and and we've all watched like um the Amri Pirons and 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 the Brooke McDonalds and they need a certain bike and 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 Brooke with with this sort of plush, I want to say plush or, or better ground hugging platform um, he's he's still good to watch because he's thundering but he like like some of the excitement we get off watching Brooke just going like that like we win and lose that but that'll be for the benefit of Brooke just going faster and more settled and and less sketchy um, and he's loving it yeah. Speaking of losing weight, Rob Warner stepped in it. Um, he said, "He said Sam Sam Blingetop's still hungry, and he's been in for so long. And he's you should see him without a shirt. He's lean, <laughs> and like you could see Elliot just like, oh, without a shirt, he's lean. <laughs> like that's that's no, like a, not, we had we had the temperatures up to thirty five degrees. We went from thirty five degrees one day to five degrees the next day. So we had like a th- 30 degree temperature change. So for sure, everyone would have been with shirts on that day. And, and the other cool thing is like, everyone was like going for a swim in the river. It was like a, you know, um, and there was like a platypus in this river, a very rare, seldom seen platypus. So it was like a full Aussie bush experience. And the after party, it wound down from the VIP thing to the rider's tent, to the, to the village by the bike park. And, and each time it got moved by security like it was like all right the vip tent's getting wrecked time to shut it down let's go to the riders tent ah uh, if you've seen the clip of some tables at the riders tent um anyway and then it went to the bike park cafe restaurants and the school all the you know public are hanging out with the riders and then it was like time and the whole time um reese had set up this the dj that was oh there was a massive dj amongst this crowd by the big um step down that was secretly set up in the bush like down the river past the campsite like a safe environment so people could safely party in the in the bush um so it was a good old proper aussie bush stuff that probably went on to like i don't know three four five in the morning um so that's another thing done right you know like 
yay world cup see there to race but like look after the riders give them a good and then and the spectators give them a good experience and give them something to do you know um it should be festivals obviously, though obviously man, the, riders like it, gonna, the riders are going the riders are going to are going to think let their yeah the riders are obviously going to let their their hair down a bit more than at a world cup because they're not going to race one the next week yeah you know, they're riding bicycles we're not you know we're not racing 24 f1 races or whatever it is like we can you know have a drink or, or even if you don't have a drink you can have a dance you can have you know you can yeah no but it like top a, riders I wasn't, I wasn't top riders is, yeah but top riders aside it sounds like they did a really good job of bringing in a festival so we'll do a whip off we'll do a normal downhill we'll do a kiddies one we'll do like a citizens maybe downhill we've got yep. this hardline event which is like the pinnacle at the end of the weekend. But how do you get the spectators there? You know, like if dad's bringing kids, then maybe the kids can race dads. Maybe there's a music festival or a band. You want to do other yeah. things because at a World Cup, at some of the venues, like there's nothing to do, right? Yeah. That's why the spectators only come in for quality and race. But yeah. if you're able to, you know, in a perfect world, make more of a festival of it, probably get more spectators there, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, the venue was at capacity, was sold out, so we can't actually get more spectators there. But but that's another thing. Year one of event, they can do things better for year two. You know, there was a little bit of, like, track uh, quality day, like some spectators just ended up in sections of the track where they couldn't be because racing drones would be flying over their heads. And so there'll be a little bit better crowd management. Like you said, there'll be a few more – oh, hello. There'll be a few more pads on trees. Um you know, there was pads on the trees that Jackson almost hit, but he flew so far and fast off track that he, um, that he like, hit trees that weren't padded. Um, and, uh, oh, we got Dr. Seuss. Oh, I remember okay, Dr. Seuss. Is, so for the audio listeners, Sven's doing a little Dr. Seuss reading. Um, speaking of kids, wait, wait, wait. Jackson. One, one more, Jackson. Andrew, and then I'll let it go. Ziggy, good, and... Bad. But you can go tell me. See, big yeah, and tall. Bad, bad. You're naughty, Andrew. He's naughty, eh, Ziggy? Naughty. <laughs> Ziggy's not too sure <laughs> She's about not this, happy. Uh, <laughs> Ziggy, you've not She's seen not... that screen with you before. Hey, we keep you away from screen, huh? Mama, come grab Ziggy. <laughs> Imagine He's you Andrew. show this to Ziggy. We're going to show this to Ziggy you remember when Andrew. she's older. Hello. It's like Ziggy. Anyway, Ziggy had a You're good time. You were on a podcast, um, Ziggy. You had a great time. I saw Ziggy. She loves seeing the but little kids. But that's kids. that's uh, that sums up a festival and a pump truck. Like like every venue should have a you know an, a pump truck of some sorts. And, and Ziggy just loved watching the little kiddies. As soon as the kids, he's like it's the same as a rider. As soon as you see another rider that you think you're as good as hitting something, then you can hit it. And, and Ziggy saw these little kids bigger than her on the pump track. And, and she's hooked. She wants to, or well, she wants his bikes now. She has a helmet. She, we got to be in one place long enough for her to get a bike. Um, <laughs> and I'm just trying to like, I'm just trying to think of things that I didn't want to forget about here. Um, I don't know if I, I'm looking at the results sheets just to like, see if it sparks memories. Um, but you um, said a good thing, like riders, even at the top level, you know, if they may be hesitant about a drop and someone does it, and then you kind of compare yourself. You think, I think I'm at their skill level, skill level. Surely I'm at their skill level. They just did the jump. And, and that's how these, you know, features get, get you know, ticked off. Uh, speaking yeah. of Jackson, you said he had a Porsche. Um, yeah. But you, you failed to say it's a shitter. Like you made it. You no, made first, it out. You made it out like he's say, splashing. He splash. You made it out like he's splashing all his money. I'm like, oh, this kid's gonna waste all his salary on cars. But uh, I'm sure he's, yeah, I'm he's, sure he's truck he got an entry his, level. His, entry level. I'm Porsche. Sure yeah, I'm sure he's like Toyota Hilux or whatever. He has cost way more than his Porsche. Um, <clears throat> but that's cool because he probably could have one of those fancy ones and he is he is grounded and, and it is just like a project car and, and his kit this um this race was was homage to that um boris is a way nicer porsche um so uh and J jackson is very jealous of boris's porsche um but uh going back to the the race oh yeah that that's what i wanted to see i was just looking at names that, that would spark memories or ideas so like 
not that every race, right? especially World Cups. World, World Cups, we you know we definitely want to see some pedaling, but it was pretty cool a track this long, and this varied with flat sections and little mini uphill sections um, could be hit 100% entirely with no chain, and not only no chain but with a 24 inch rear back wheel. Oh yeah, we talk about Remy Morton. I was when I saw his bike, I was like, how is he? I mean, I get the coolness what he wants to do and be different, like. You have to pedal at some point. Not on a. I mean, clearly this race you can just. How does he get from the lift to the first trail in Queenstown? Like, does he push? Um, from the lift? You mean more like back to the lift? Um, Queenstown. Yeah, or back the to, the to the lift. First tra- the lift to the first trail in Queenstown is sweet. You just coast, um, and maybe you could even pump your whole way back to the lift at the end of the trails in Queenstown. But, no, um, but Queenstown too. If a lot of the trails is uphill. But anyway. Um, I know what you're saying. He's not, he's not, not, he's not riding those trails. Uh, yeah. True, yeah, true. He's was, building his own was, amazing it was, trails. It was, but that it was makes sense because cool. um, Conor Farron, I thought Conor Farron's top split made a hell of a lot of sense because he's on flats, greasy, yeah. and he could obviously maintain it because he's Conor Farron, but as well as um, it was a lot of pumping and not a lot of pedaling and, and things like that. So it would be a little easier for him to carry the same speed at high speed as the guys on clips. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, there's well all well. sorts of, no, there's so many, you know, we haven't, we're not discussing this like we would break down a normal race, like in terms of speed and stats and positions and stuff. But um, if we are, um, I see the internet armchair bandits have already done this for us. They timed when Jackson dropped out the start gate to where he crashed and the, the crack on the street is, he was 1.5 seconds up on Ronan at the exact same time. And that was very, very high up on the track. I'd say a third of the way down. So does that mean he would have won by four and a half seconds or under five seconds or three seconds? Maybe. But as we know, it's a race and you need to finish it. Um, so, yeah. And, and then having heard Booker and Jackson crashed, uh, it also – Basically, that's Bernard says, hearing Jackson crash and knowing Booker crash and, and two riders that, that are um, obviously you, you can you can pick and choose what to do. Bernard said, like, if he hadn't had that news, he would have gone a bit quicker. But he literally just was like, he, he just said he played it way too safe. Um, and he obviously, Bernard's here to win it. He's won three before. Um, and he definitely was one of the guys, if you put, put on everyone's favorites, it was like, there was a Bernard camp and a Jackson camp. Um, I had Booker as an underdog. Uh, maybe no one thought um, just because, well, like you assume, less track time. Um, but he, yeah, he's, he's a, you know, it was hard to gauge speed and who was going to do well because until race morning was the first time they were like pushing super hard. Um, and uh, like it was very apparent that Jackson like stepped up massively on race days as well as Bernard. And, and I think Bernard, on some of those loose berms before the road gap, he was hitting berm, 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 and a couple of the others were shaving the berms and just catching the end of the berms. So he lost a bit of time perhaps to, to Ronan there. And um, speaking of race morning and the day before race day, <coughs> it's pretty, I wouldn't say sad, but at least three other women would have, done their race runs so their their deal was with them they said like you have to have completed the whole entire course before we let you to race day which is like a very very fair um thing to say and do they literally ran out of time they needed i would say if they you couldn't really start earlier if the girls just went up in the race morning because it was very wet still from the night before so it would have been quite sketchy but literally, and then if they literally had another half hour in the schedule, they would have been able to push up one more time just to the lower half of the track, and they would have. I'm going to say they all would have hit that last jump. But um, so uh, they were, they were all like, because in the end of the day, the last jump that that couple of them hadn't hit, that was the only feature they hadn't hit. That was the easier one out of the features they hit. Just hard to string together in a complete entire run, you know, which. Yeah. You're coming out of those, you know, by the time race runs happened, the wind was perfect. But in practice on race day, the wind was still very gusty. So when you come off the road gap, you're not exposed. But when you hit the shark fins, 
you're very exposed to the wind and then when you hit that creek gap you're exposed to the wind and and um you know it's pushing you the one direction but when you hit the shark fin then it's side wind and then when you hit the creek gap it's, it's either tail or headwind on race day so it was a bit harder but come race run time there was no wind really and they would have been 100 percent fine but fair play they you know like they had to have hit it first you can't just throw someone to hit it first on, on a live feed on a race run um, but they were so so close of to also hitting at the the other three or four girls so it's a bummer for them but they you know they pretty much deserve the same i would say the same uh, praise as, credit, as credit, Gracie definitely and and lou well i mean um, it's also smart like you heard tane say you know she just wasn't comfortable there wasn't enough time it's not worth it like she done so much it's like it's a win for her this weekend i'm sure she would have for wanted sure. to race obviously but it's a yeah it's a win what those ladies went and did up there like it's unbelievable what they were riding down and i don't even know half of them uh of the field after three minutes of holding onto the bike that um, container dropped if you didn't get it absolutely battery perfect which i think Sam did. He was probably the smoothest. Everyone else, I don't know how they didn't blow their hands off the bars, to be quite honest. But Bernard yeah. qualified fastest, right? Yes. Now, you see, the challenge with quali qualifying fastest and the varying conditions, it's very difficult to know how hard to push, you know. Uh, well, like I said, it's often heard, the guy that heard. doesn't qualify fastest pushes a little bit harder and can take the win. It happens all the time. Plus, yeah, he, heard he heard that Jack stuff. But I'm just saying, Jackson it's always... Went down and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's probably like, mm, I sh probably don't want to do the same, you know. He's yeah, probably got well, another year was... or two of, of throwing caution to the wind and trying to win a World Cup, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I um, yeah, looked forward to see, you know, where it goes and, and who all is going to take the start next year. Um, it's a good time of the year for the, you know, the guys are back on their big bikes. They're doing other races. Crankworks is coming up. Some of them have come from Threadbow. So it, it is a good time of the year. You know, seasons are start way too late for for all of us and for all of them. Um, you know, for William in is that May or June? May, it's still a long May? time away. May, yeah. yeah, beginning of May. So it is so a good a time, time to maybe risk yeah. it as well. So okay, something yeah. could happen. Hopefully, not too bad. Southern Hemisphere summer, so it's it's like you know, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a couple more of the top races taking the start here next year because you know, it, people have seen it's it runs good like a downhill track should and and um it's not super sketchy and you know and then of course they'll be at the disadvantage in following years you know as it should be if you committed to the first year and you're here then you get a bit more advantage of knowing the track then then so be it and is there enough free practice if the weather holds like can you just go down get a shuttle or like does everyone shuttle at the same time like how uh, the, uh, can you there, get like more practice than others like, can you get enough practice Bernard, if you want? Bernard got more can practice you just lap than it? others. Jackson got three runs in on uh, before race runs. Others all got two. So you can you can get more runs in. I'd say on, on pra open practice day, you're not going to get four or five runs like a World Cup, but you'll definitely get you can you'll definitely get three if you want to, or four if you pushed for it. Um, and maybe in, in future years you could get a bit more, but there is enough. They don't wait for everyone to get down before they go up in the shuttles. On on the practice day when they are lapping, there are shuttles going up at different times, and they don't wait for them to get full. So, uh, so it's up to you. Yeah, if you want to get more practice, you can. Um, there'll be you know all the logistics will be worked out a bit better, crowd control a bit better. So you know we probably lost a little bit of practice. I'd say one lap of practice time on on quality day, um, just getting. There was just such a massive crowd and they were all over the show, up in trees. And, and the problem is on the features like this, you know, one guy 50 meters off the track can roll rocks into the track. So you've got to be very careful of, of where you got your spectators, you know. So it, it was I did a, it um, was I a, did see the that gnarly step down the on where you hop onto the wood, the then hop one. off. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The big one, which you spoke about earlier, which I was like, oh my goodness, you kind of hop. You kind of feel like you're moving sideways. You clip the end of the wood and then you hop again. Anyway, all the spectators were on the top of the boom. I'm like, that's a bit of a safety hazard because if someone goes over the boom, it's just like so, they're on the boom. So the trajectory, it, so little, originally, little, originally, yeah. originally they were just before the boom. 
and and then on the berm a little bit like but not where they would have the bike would have come or the bike would have shot out the back but then i also did they were quite strict with that on race on quality day which is what took so long to get started but literally like literally every time the poor marshal turned his back the people that he kicked off other people who walked up the mountain and then they put themselves on the back of the berm and, and it was um it was uh, it, in fact i think the there's going to be a t-shirt like made because everyone because you could have heard about a hundred times the marshal said get off the berm get off the berm <laughs> and, um, they, for sure there'll be a t-shirt saying but yeah so that, that's like one of the one of the things where um it, it would be sort of um marshaled a bit better and and you know you know you you're Having 40 marshals on a track is is more than we get. Well, probably the same as we get. I don't know at a World Cup, but uh, even then, when you got 5,000 people and 5,000 is not a lot, but when there's 5,000, can only go to sort of three or four parts of the track to to watch. Um, it's and, and then also you got the racing drones that are coming out of nowhere. Um, yeah, and I think I think a few things can be tied up. You know, like I don't know if the, this. I heard there was on the live feed there was pixelated feed because the signal. So maybe they need to get boosters to get a stronger 3G signal or however they're running the drones. Um, some of the static cams look a bit mechanical, like you get this weird zooming thing. Um, maybe that could be a bit nicer. Yeah, yeah, man. But I mean, I guess we're not going to harp on. I mean, first year, it's like it's no, going to be teething, yeah. teething issues like plenty. That's what I'm saying. It's I, I, I wouldn't want to – I felt Gracie looked the best. I mean, out of the whole field, she looked great. Like, yeah. I'm not saying and, and for Shane, the girls Shane she looked Lewis. great because there was two. I'm like, Gracie yeah. looked great on the bike. And like that step up, jump after the big step down we just spoke about looked great. Yeah, I was really, really impressed with her. But I mean, I knew that she come, she's come. she got a great you know, jumping pedigree and she's going to be a star in the future, a big star. And uh, yeah, Ferguson got very unlucky. Like all her crashes happened in her race run. She 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 has the crash of the day though. Yeah, and that's just, just unlucky. That's just like you know, and you you know you've, you've your mind somewhere else thinking about the next thing down the track, you know, and and that's what happens, and and now you're pushing it in a race run. Um, yeah, Gracie, uh, her you know her I think it's her dad runs or owns or built Coast Gravity Park, you know, so it's definitely in her DNA and her blood, and that would have been from when she was a little little girl. So she's got comfortable from a very young age hitting hitting those bigger jumps and. Um, hitting them with style as well. And and she also did a smart thing and she got there a lot earlier because there's quite a bit of jet lag if you're coming from east or west, you know. Um, she got there like four days before track walk and did her track walk. So it it just took that time to mentally like break down each each obstacle, let it percolate a little bit. And then in the meantime, ride the bike park, get used to the dirt, the terrain, the, you know, that's a big part of, especially this terrain, you went through like four or five ecosystems. You went through rainforest, you went through this black, black, grippy dirt, then you went to this dusty, dusty dirt, and then you went to hard packed bike park berm. So, um, you know, come come hardline sessioning, she was already comfortable with the location, the dirt, the topography, the geology, and she had already thought about the jumps for four days. So, you know, is it a surprise? She was rider of the week, and and yeah, as you said, you noticed that she looked most comfortable and looked most stylish, or and that's why she won Rider of the Week. She didn't win it because she was the first woman to get down the track. You know, this is not a token event to to give. Yeah. It's not a you know um, not a token event to to make women look good. She did it because she was like the best Rider of the Week between men and women. So that was cool. And I believe I don't. I'm not sure about this, but I'm almost 100% certain when I, you know, I'm, I'm shooting podiums and stuff. I want to know, is there a women's podium? How's it going to work? And I think the women decided they don't want their own division. They want to be, we don't need a women's podium. We're going to be a GC, a general ranking. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. But also, like, if there's more women... Uh, that, you know, it would be cool to see a women's division, but they were the ones because there were people then said, Oh, why don't you give the women their podium or their prize money? But I think it was their decision to be they want to be treated as equals, which is cool. And this track, you know, does equal everyone. 
Yeah, definitely. I think we can wrap it up there. I think for first year, huge success, going somewhere exotic, Tasmania, another success. You want to see that more. We get to watch some racing end of Feb because we've got to wait till May. Crankworks is coming up yeah. as well. So it's cool, these these uh, races before the World Cup season. So Sven, thanks so much for uh, all you do out there and, uh, with your whole family. And yeah, I know. I mean, you're going to butt in six times it up. before we end. Yeah, you wrap it up. No, I'm not wrapping it up, but um, it was pretty funny to see like a couple of big name riders bail the tents because Jackson saw the most harmless spider in all of uh, in all of Australia, and he put it in the riders' chat. And then next thing you know, like there's two very high profile riders that are sleeping in hotels um, just because of his friendly like rain spider, huntsman spider. Um, in in and then, his defence. Everything there can kill you. So, what do you mean? There's a there's a chilled spider. Not there? this spider. Not this spider. I mean, how do you know? In South Africa. Are you sure? Well, they didn't. What know, is it? Obviously, um, it was a huntsman, um, and uh, which is like our rain spider. The big little spider. Yeah, yeah, big spiders. Yeah. yeah. But um, wrapping it up in since there's a Crank Brothers race report, um, more no more fitting than. Um, Ronan Dunn doing a shoey out of a Crank Brother proto shoe that we'll see later this year. There you go. See, one in a proto shoe, one on the pedals. So he's got his first hardline win with a brand that's synonymous with downhill racing. What more could you love? And did a, and did a and good did a old shoey in Tasmania. And then went the and fans. had a big bush and had a big bush to bush to. And now he's in doof. Queenstown. I mean, I'm watching those guys' social media and I'm thinking. Man, to be 21 and winning races and then flying off to Queenstown, that poor town. But I do know they're going to ride their bike. I do know they're going to ride their bike a lot. There's more risk riding for a week in Queenstown um, with Ronan and, and Theo and them than there was a week in Hardline. And um, That's probably true. One more thing with, with how the athletes looked after, say more so at this event than maybe any others they're used to doing. Um, a little anecdote, the physio... I'm I'm forgetting his name. Um, you know, we have a lot of top quality doctors and, and medics and nurses, but the physio there that was at the rider's disposal, um, he went so out of his way, besides helping Jackson through the whole process, on the, the day after, on Sunday, all shops like old school South Africa are closed. They wanted to get a, him a stabilizing brace so that he could fly home and not do any further damage and, you know, get an MRI. He... He really made it happen. He caught, He remembered one of his old employees from 20 years ago. He owns a shop, like a physio shop or whatever. So he called this guy. This guy was on holiday at his holiday home, three hours away from his shop. The guy got in his car, drove to the shop, opened it up, got this knee brace, got it to Jackson so he could get it on the plane before the flight. I mean, this is like... You know, this is pretty cool. And this is not something he had to do or what Red Bull forced him to do. He just just took it upon himself to, you know, he wanted to have the athlete having the best possible care and, and um, experience with the event. And, that, you know, that just goes, that's part of like the Aussie true grit and the Aussie spirit. And, and uh, you know, more people should be like that uh, in this world, I reckon. No, I mean, that uh, brings back memories from people in South Africa going on their way for some of the races back in the day. I just, you know, stories that my dad and Spook told me. So um, props to the, the physios. Uh, if anyone can and, ping uh, us the whole, his the name, whole we can team, tag yeah. him as well. Yeah, But uh, yeah. let's let Sven go. Um, he's taking a lot of time out of his, his family uh, days off here. I've got to get him. I've got to be at the airport in 20 minutes. There you go. So uh, that was your Crank Brothers race review. I told you they've won like a million World Champs titles in a row. I'm starting to forget how many it is. Um, prototype shoes that Sven's just told you about that I don't even know if he's allowed to tell you about, and that's where you come and listen. That's Ziggy if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening, Sven's daughter, and uh, keeping him very young. We won't give away Sven's age, but you can guess it. And uh, I think that's over and out from us.